Well, I want to look uh, with you this morning at another story from the time of Elijah, kind of looking at their the lives of the two prophets. But we're going to go a little bit out of order, um, out of the timeline. We're going to come back to Elijah on Mount Carmel perhaps next week. But I, I want to look at an account with King Ahab when he fought the king of Assyria. Uh, his name was Ben-Hadad. Uh, it's in 1 Kings chapter 20. But, you know, I was really quickened by this thought as I was kind of meditating yesterday morning on, on the message and what to speak. And, and this story really came to my mind. And it's in 1 Kings chapter 20. Um, now, the background is that Ben-Hadad attacks uh, Israel thinking, well, they're going to be a pushover, right? We're just going to conquer them. Um, and, but a prophet comes to King Ahab and says something to him, a prophet of the Lord. Um, and in 1 Kings 20, verse 13, it says, A prophet came to Ahab, the king of Israel, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you seen this great multitude? Right? And there was a multitude with the Syrians against Israel. Behold, I will deliver them into your hand this day, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, by this time, they had kind of come out of that season of judgment. They'd been in that judgment for three and a half years of no rain upon the land. And then, you know, Elijah brings or prays and God brings the rain. And so they're coming out and, right, the, the land has seen rain. It's beginning to blossom. Then an enemy comes and comes against Israel. And God uses it as an opportunity to rebuild the faith of Israel and their God. He uses it as an opportunity, and, and he says, I will deliver them into your hand, and you shall know that I am God. And, you know, there comes a time when God you know, restores people, builds them up, and he reveals himself to them because he wants them to know, I am God. And I so long for that time. I long for that time in Clearwater. Mm -hmm. It's in our nation. So many people are, are walking their own way, and, you know, God's allowing them to do that for a time, but there's going to come a, a season where he's going to move and he's going to show them, I am That's right. God. Amen. And he's doing that here in Israel. And so the Syrian doesn't think much of, the uh, Syrian king doesn't think much of Israel. He's told that the Israelites have come out to fight against him. And, and so what does he do? He just sends the young men. He just sends the, the inexperienced ones. Well, you guys go take care of them, capture them and bring them back alive. Um, but then well, we know that the, that the Lord gives the victory to the Israelites and the Syrians flee before them. Um, you know, they rout them. They sent back to their cities. And then another prophet comes to Ahab and he says something basically. He's like, don't slack, stay strong because the Syrians are going to come back again next year. So they, they're not going to give up. But there's something in this story that I really want us to, to examine here because of what the Syrians said. So after they lost the battle, they came together. And they and I don't know how the prophet, you know, he must have Lord must allow him to be a fly on the wall, or somehow the word got back to them of, of what they were saying, right? The Syrians in their council chamber to the king. And so they were trying to figure out, well, why did we lose this battle? And the, the wise men came to the conclusion, well, they, they lost because they fought Israel in the wrong place. And we can read this in 1 Kings 20. Let's read verses 23 through 25. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto them, unto him, their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we are. But let's fight against them in the plain. We will be stronger than them. And do this thing, take, take the king's way, every man to his place, and put captains over them, number the, an army as you had before, you know, horse for horse, chariot for chariot, and fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than them. And the king listened to their voice, and he did that. And, you know, you can read this account, and you can think that they considered, well, they, we, they, we just need to fight somewhere else where we have the advantage. You know, and they said that, but... You know, God viewed this differently. He kind of took it personally, in a sense. Um, right? They were declaring that God's power was limited. He could only help them in the mountains. 
but in the valley he couldn't help them you know that he could protect them or so forth so they gathered together in the plain um, perhaps in the in uh, near Samaria the flat plains of the valley of Jezreel or as we know it in the New Testament Armageddon mm -hmm. they thought well let's gather in Armageddon and see if we can win um, the scriptures are very graphic and right? it says that the numbers of Israel they were gathered together in that valley in the plains and they were like two little flocks of goats and the rest of the valley was filled with the Assyrians just overwhelming numbers mm -hmm. to conquer them they probably felt pretty good at that moment, the Syrians did. And the Is you know, Israelites were probably like, yikes. But notice what God says. First Kings uh, 20 and verse 28. It says, There came a man of God and spoke unto the king of Israel and said, Thus says the Lord, Because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore, I'm going to deliver all this multitude into your hands, and you shall know that I am God. Big mistake, huh? <laughs> to, to talk that way about the Lord. You know, and, and, you know, the wicked do that all the time. Mm -hmm. They don't know that the Lord's listening. He's paying attention. And there comes a day when he is going to show he is God. Amen. He is God. And he's not just the God of the mountains. Amen. He's the God of the valleys mm -hmm. and the plains. And so he proved it. And Israel slew 100,000, and the rest fled to their city. And then a wall fell on them, you know, slaying another 27,000. And so God judged the enemies of Israel for speaking against the Most High. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty neat story. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was really quickened with the application. Right. There's a lot you could bring out about this, and there's more to the story, but God was really speaking this to me yesterday, that there's a message in here for us. Mm -hmm. you know, we can have powerful experiences with God. We can meet Him, you know, and, and mm -hmm. most of us are here because we've met with God in the past, and He's drawn us. We feel Him speaking to us, and sometimes they can be like mountain experiences. Where we, we know we have met with God. Mm -hmm. But you know, the enemy will try to come at us in a certain way. And he doesn't come and say, God doesn't, well, he will try and convince us that God doesn't exist if we're open to that. But most of the time, none of us are going to believe that argument that God doesn't exist. We've met him <laughs> in the mountains. But you know what he does say? Well, you met God up there, but you wait till you get to regular life. You had a good time in church, but wait till Monday morning. Mm -hmm. when you have to get back to work. He's the God of the hills, but I'm in control of the valleys. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you what, how it goes the rest of the week. I'll give you Sunday, but you got to give me Monday through Saturday. He's happy with that arrangement. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. he, he wants to, God to just be the God of the valley, or the mountains, and not the plains or mm -hmm. the valleys. And so... You know, if we let the enemy persuade us, then that's where he can get us. You know, that he would like to persuade us that even though we've had experiences, you know, we've heard his voice. We've even felt his fire at times. You know, each year we run that summer camp in the mountains of Pennsylvania. And it's kind of like this story. These kids, they come and they experience the power of God, the fire of God. You know, they meet him in the altar calls and during the messages and the worship, and they have these powerful experiences. In fact, I mean, some of the most powerful moves of God I've ever personally experienced have been at that camp where he just flows and because he wants to meet that generation right. and establish them. And, you know, those kids have been, they, you know, there's powerful prophecies being spoken. Um, the worship, you know, is so powerful. It's like the river of God flowing. I mean, we've seen kids just fall down, no one praying for them, and it's just the power of God comes upon them. Mm -hmm. And you know how embarrassed kids are. We've seen kids dancing with all the light for hours because they've met with God. Mm -hmm. But you know, there is mm -hmm. one problem that they face. It's going home. Right. They've met God on the mountain, but now, you know, really what's most important is that they meet 
God in the valleys or on the plains, on the everyday life. Right? And so the enemy is not going to deny the powerful experiences they've had, but when they come back to normal life, that's where they struggle because they can believe the voice of the enemy. Well, okay, I'll give you that experience. That was pretty good, but I got you now that you've come home. Mm -hmm. And some just, you know, sometimes we can get into that cycle. Well, finally I can meet God, have that special meeting. I go to that revival meeting or, you know, maybe you've met people that just kind of live for the next big meeting. Mm -hmm. But in between, they, there's not life. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's because they have not yet met the God of the plains and of the valleys, who wants to meet with them in the day to day. Well, God's making a big point to Israel here. He is the God of the plains and he's the God of the valleys. And so like the psalmist said, Psalm 139, verse seven, he said, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up to heaven, you're there. Praise God, when we get to heaven, he's going to be there. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't, doesn't end if he, if he ascends up to heaven. But if I have to make my bed in hell, in the lowest parts, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me, your right hand will hold me. Mm -hmm. The psalmist mm -hmm. was experiencing God in every place that he was led. And he was making that declaration, Lord, you're the God of heaven, and I have, I'm going to look forward to being with you in heaven, but yet I'm on earth, and sometimes earth feels like the lowest depths mm -hmm. of, you know, of hell. Mm -hmm. As we're walking through the valleys, and sometimes it's the plains, it's just the day-to-day -day average, you know, walk. Sometimes people, you know, their hardest time is just when nothing's going on. Mm -hmm keeping a hold of God. Other people, it's the valleys. It's the trials and the tribulations. You know, so for some people, that causes them to cry out to God more and meet with Him, and they can hold on to God, but they struggle in the plains. Whereas other people, I'm okay as long as nothing bad goes wrong, right? But God wants to be our God of every place that He brings us to. Amen. And so the question is, is He a God of every place in our lives. We've had meetings in the past where he has spoke, he's spoken to us, we've experienced his power, our hearts been moved. But then, Monday morning. He has to be the God of Monday mornings. Does anyone have trouble with Monday mornings? Well, you, you retired folks, you've graduated from that. <laughs> but you know, when you have to face work and all the pressures and the the things, well, I'm sure you're retired folks, you got your uh, Monday morning <laughs> issues too, you know, different things going on, but, but the mountain is a wonderful place. It's like Peter said, Lord, let's, let's pitch a tent here on the Mount of Transfiguration. Lord, let's build a shelter. Let's, let's make this a dwelling place. But you know, Jesus said, sorry, we have to go down. This, I got work to do in the plains and in the valleys. Actually, the Father spoke something at that very moment. Mm -hmm. and what did he say? Mark 9, verse 7. You don't hear the Father speak very much in Scripture, but he did hear. Mm -hmm. And so what did he say? This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Mm -hmm. Hear him. This is the key, really of God being the God Amen. of every place we are in. Amen. And, you know, it's what will allow God to be over us in the mountains, in the plains, and in the valleys is when we hear his voice, when he speaks to us, because his voice empowers us to follow him. What takes us off course is the voice of the enemy. And... You know, because the enemy didn't deny the God of the mountains, but they were trying to speak to, to Israel. Well, he can help you there, but he can't help you here in this situation. He's not the God of the plains or the valleys. And, and so the enemy would love nothing better than for us to listen to his voice 
-hmm. and you know just kind of relegate ourselves to well I've met God here but when I'm walking in this situation I can't overcome because the mountain experiences aren't enough to keep us we have to meet with the Lord as the Lord said to Israel in Psalm 95 and verse 7 he is our God we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand today if you will hear his voice we're the sheep of his hand today if we will hear his voice and you know the thought is we can continue as his sheep in his pathway whether we're he's the shepherd is leading us on the mountain or down the mountain to the plains or down into the valleys we'll be fine wherever we are as sheep who hear his voice because he leads us every step of the way as a good shepherd does and so we can you know we can all picture the the shepherd just kind of leading and calling his sheep leading them to water uh, leading them to to pasture or to the safety of the sheep pen at night you know to to protect them but what does it require it's lots of times of the shepherd calling out to the sheep and them hearing his voice and them responding going after him the sheep that don't listen what happens to them mm. well they get thirsty they get hungry mm. and they get lost mm. because they don't hear his voice some of them probably don't make it mm. because of that and that's really the lesson of the sheep is that they they hear his voice and it's not because not just because they love the shepherd it's because they have to what sheep is going to survive if they don't respond well they might for a little because the shepherd's going to have to go out and find them and keep pulling them back but at some point they're going to get into trouble mm -hmm. and so it's the requirement and so to know god is the god of the plains and the valleys right there are some requirements we can understand mm -hmm. as sheep the requirement of obedience right that we hear and do and you know in the Hebrew they didn't make that distinction if you hear the voice of God that meant obedience right if you didn't obey then you didn't hear and that's you know in one sense what the Lord is is saying to us hear O Israel right if we hear we do and so we must obey and then there's the thought of faithfulness Right? is that we have to be continue to obey. That idea of continuing day after day so that we can follow God as the sheep of his pasture. Now, I was just thinking about those who are successful in areas of life. And, you know, you could pick out an example of like, you know, an athlete or an Olympian. They become successful and it's not just because of a big effort they give to train. I mean, all Olympians, they give a huge effort to train. But, you know, often those who become great at something in an Olympic sport, like swimming or running or whatever it could be, it's, they did so because they found a way to make it a way of life. They said, this is my life. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become great at this, and to do that, I'm going to make it a way of life. I'm going to give everything to it. I'm going to eat I'm gonna eat it, breathe it, sleep it, mm -hmm. whatever, so that I can be the best at it. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's really a good picture of, of what it means to, to follow God and to be his sheep. Make it a way of life. That it is our way. You know, that, that thought of, coming back to that thought of illustration of summer camp and youth camp, you know, the ones who have troubles when they get home are the ones who struggle at giving up their old way of life. Because they met God on the mountain and then they come back and they realize, you know, I gotta make some changes to my way of life. I have to transform in that sense. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, some of them say, well, I'm not sure if I'm ready to give up the, those friends that God was dealing with or that music I was listening to or relationships or entertainment or whatever it is mm. and they struggle and God can't be the God of the, the plains and the valleys for them but when, when walking with God becomes a way of life we're not the same because every day 
we draw near to him and we hear his voice. Now there's a lot we could say about hearing God's voice, but you know, sometimes it can get hard to get from A to Z, right? A being we're just a little lamb learning uh, the voice of God to Z being right those men and women of faith who have those conversations with God and you know mm -hmm. you've heard all the stories of Pastor Bailey or different ones you know talking with the Lord or or so forth mm -hmm. how do we get from A to Z well it starts with what Christ said in Luke 18 and verse 17 he said truly I say unto you whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no way enter in now Christ presented this in the negative, but we could kind of rephrase this to the positive. Whoever desires to enter in and to progress in the kingdom of God has to become like that little child. And what does a little child look like in this respect of, of hearing God's voice? Well, we can consider this story of Samuel. Right? He was a little child who was learning to hear the voice of God. And we know the story of how God was calling him, and he just didn't recognize God's voice. He thought it was Eli, and he kept going to Eli. And Eli would say, come on, I didn't call you. I'm trying to get some sleep. Go back to bed. And it took three times for Eli to realize, oh, this is the voice of God. And so he gave some instruction to young Samuel. He said, the next time you hear it, you just respond to God and said, you just say, speak, Lord servant is listening and he did that the next time God spoke he just responded speak Lord your servant is listening and you know there had to be a shift in Samuel a shift from the natural right he was just focused on the natural hearing of Eli he just thought oh that must be Eli calling me but Eli was saying no there needs to be a shift of what you hear in your ears or what you're sensing it's not the natural, it's the spiritual. It's God. And, you know, sometimes we have to cry out to God, Lord, let there be a shift. We're so accustomed to natural ways of, of observing things or seeing things or thinking about things. Mm -hmm. But to hear from God, there has to be a shift into the spiritual. Mm -hmm. Lord, I want to recognize how your spirit is moving. I want to recognize your voice mm -hmm. and how you're leading me and guiding me. Sometimes things are going on in our hearts and we don't know how to interpret them. We don't know that it's God kind of nudging us this way or that way. And we think, oh, mm -hmm. well, something's going on. I'm feeling weird. Maybe it was the pizza I ate last night. I don't know. And sometimes it can be the Lord trying to lead us and guide us. And mm -hmm. so we have to cry out to the Lord, Lord, let there be a shift in my understanding that I can learn to hear and recognize your voice, the things of the Spirit. You know, and it, God can move in our lives in many different ways. Sometimes you, you hear people in those stories and God's almost like speaking to them audibly and I'm like, if that's hearing from God, I don't, I don't have a chance. I mean, how can I hear that way? But, you know, they got there after many many years mm -hmm. of learning mm -hmm. the voice of God. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm ever going to get to that place of literally hearing, you know, maybe in heaven, but, um, mm -hmm. but you know, there's that learning process of him speaking to us. Most of the time, it's just like, I can't even identify, I just feel something in my spirit. And I've learned to know, you know, God's, maybe he's speaking something, he's doing something. Mm -hmm we can learn to recognize it or sometimes it's through peace the peace he gives us or a lack of peace not, oh god's speaking mm -hmm. or we read the bible and something jumps out god's speaking mm -hmm. and he so longs mm -hmm. to speak to us but the point is it's so that he can be the god of the mountains he'll speak to us at church and we can have some really powerful meetings but he longs to be with us in the plains and in the valleys mm -hmm. as we walk with him day by day. Now, one thought I want to just share in closing is how practical this really is. Because sometimes we think, man, this is spiritual. It's invisible. I don't understand how it goes on 
it's mystical, you know, in that sense of, you know, God working. But, you know, it is actually so practical. Mm -hmm. It's an exercise. It's a spiritual exercise. And actually that, you know, the hardest part is, is not necessarily the hearing from God. I think the hardest part is making ourselves available to God. I firmly believe that if we make ourselves available to God, he will teach us. He's a good teacher. He'll teach us to hear his voice more and more clearly, more and more powerfully. The hardest part I face is being faithful to make myself available to him. You know, I firmly believe that God is always there speaking, desiring to speak, but I'm like that old time radio. I haven't tuned myself in. I need to keep turning that knob and you hear all the static and you know all that stuff going on and then, oh, I heard it. Mm -hmm. Because I took the time to tune myself in. Mm -hmm. We're like a radio with a bad knob, you know? It's like yeah. as soon as we tune in and then we focus on us, you know, it's off to another channel and then we have to, yeah. the ones who, who I really respect with faith, they've, they've learned to change their radio knob that it's just, that's the default. It's always, well, maybe they've just learned to do what's necessary every day mm -hmm. to tune in to God. That's what I desire, what I long for. Mm -hmm. But there's that very practical aspect that we have to learn to make ourselves available to him day by day. And how do we do that? Well, when I said practical, it's spending time in this book, <coughs> opening our spirit to his word. You know, when I, when I read this, sometimes I just think about, this is like a language that I'm trying to keep going over. This is the vocabulary. God often speaks to us through stories in the Bible, illustrations through verses that we've read. And, you know, sometimes I, I think about the Proverbs and I read through that, the Proverbs, and it was like 25 individual thoughts. And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't I've just read all that, and I don't know if I remember anything I just read because they were so diverse. But it's amazing how God can bring something back to us that we read last month. But it's because we opened ourselves to it, and he can speak to us through that. And so we want to continually allow him or give that place where he can speak to us through his word, through those stories and verses. Of course, prayer is a major thing where we're opening our spirit to him. Well, we're presenting our requests, making them known unto God, but then in prayer we also have that time where the psalmist says, you know, I prayed to you and I looked up. I set my eyes upon heaven and I opened my, my heart to receive as well. And so, you know, where we spend time, he wants to meet with us. And of course we have, you know, that that time where we can open ourselves to him is when we come here into his tabernacle and we open ourselves to him in worship and in praise where he wants to meet us as a body of believers and give us direction and discernment and victory. The more we make ourselves available to him, the more we will know him and hear his voice mm -hmm. and be changed That's and right. transformed and he will be our God and we will be his people, Amen. the sheep of his pasture. Right. And so he wants to be with us wherever we are. We, none of us can picture a shepherd who only is with his sheep in the, in the mountains. And when they're in the valleys and the plains, they're on their own. <laughs> he wants to be with us wherever we are. In the glorious places of the mountains, in the day-to-day the -day activity of the plains, in the valleys, in the difficulties could probably go on a lot talking about the different valleys God wants to meet us in but wherever we are he is there wanting to meet with us wanting to speak to us and maybe Sarah can come and we can just close in a, a little chorus and you know I was just quicken with that thought that the Lord would cause a shift in our thinking mm -hmm. sometimes I am so naturally minded you know, I'll just be doing something and I, I, something has to be done and I'm trying to figure out how can I get this done and I don't even think about Lord. Can I have wisdom or Lord? Would you show